Today I want to talk to you for the next uh, few minutes on one word, just one simple word. And we've all either have had this happen to us or we have, we have actually done this, uh, this one word. And the word is, can anybody want to guess it? Okay, wait, well, it's wrong. The one word I want to talk about today is dropped. Dropped, like you dropped something. You've either dropped something in your life or you've been dropped or somebody's dropped something on you, but you've been dropped. That word, I don't think anybody can escape the effects of the word dropped. And sometimes it's good. You drop some things out of your life and that's a good thing. And some things, sometimes something's dropped in your life and it's not so good. And sometimes it's dropped in your life and it's a great thing. But the word dropped has, it reaches all kind of directions in our lives. And so today I want to talk to you about that word dropped. Amen. So have you ever felt like, don't answer out loud. Have you ever felt like you've been dropped? You ever felt like you've been disappointed? You ever felt like you've been left holding the bag? That's kind of the direction I want to go today, more on the side of being dropped and not so good dropped not that God dropped a million dollars into your bank account because that ain't going to happen if you want a million dollars in your bank account go to work get a job make good decisions amen hallelujah so oh, he's not with me till there well you're not alone if you feel like you've been dropped or disappointed or things didn't go the way you wanted if you feel like that in your life you are not alone I don't know of a person alive that at some point in their life has not felt like this, they've been, something has dropped in their life. But here's what, uh, here's the hang up with the word dropped. Here's what the devil would want you to think that you're the only one that's ever happened to. You know why I want you to think that? Because if he can get you to thinking that I'm the only one that has ever been dropped, I'm the only one that this has ever happened to. No one else in the world has ever experienced this. He gets to you to wallowing in your self-pity. And when you get to wallowing in your self-pity, guess what? You will, you will find someone, I promise, that will come along beside you and wallow with you. When I was a kid, I like to tell my stories about when I was growing up because I know them more than anything. When I was a kid, we used to have some pigs, Miss Fonda. We had some sows. Some of you younger folks, that means the mama pig. All right? And she was big, and we had piglets, uh, and, and, and they would have oh, all kind of pigs. And, and we had a boar. That's, a, that's the male, by the way. And uh, so we had these pigs, and, and, and we had them in this pen, and we, mud, mud hole. Never fail that you get one pig in there, it ain't going to be long, you'll have two pigs wallowing in the pit. They just want to get around. I mean, I don't know what it is about a pig that wants to wallow in the mud and the poo. But you get, and they'll root around in it like they got their nose in it. And they just wallow it. If you're not careful, guess what? They'll wallow out a hole. And it'll get deeper and deeper and deeper. That thing will be full of water and it, they just keep on rooting and it, it's just, Nasty. They get to wallowing. You know what? That's what the devil wants you to feel like. When you feel dropped, the devil wants you to think, well, if you can just get somebody to wallow with you, see what you're doing. See, they're occupying time, this, these pigs, but what they're doing, they're just digging a deeper hole, making a bigger mess. And if you're not careful, you get the wrong people around you, they'll start wallowing with you, and the next thing you know, you got two digging a hole. And if you ain't careful, they got a friend they'll bring. And they're helping, now you got three wallowing in this pit. You know what a pig does? A pig eats and poops. And they poop in the spot where they're wallowing. And it stinks. And there's flies. And nobody wants to be around the pig pen. We used to call it, when I was growing up, we fed the pigs anything. We called it slop. That's table garbage. You put it in a bucket, and you take it out there, and, man, they loved it. They thought, my Lord, look at this corn. Hey, look at this prime rib. Look at these baked potatoes left over. Man, they just went to town. Stunk. They'd eat what you gave them, and it'd stink. 
And when you drop, if you're not careful and you hang around the, around the wrong people, they eat what you're giving them, and you eat what they're giving you, and you wallow. And when you sit to wallow, and guess what? The devil's got you. Well, how did all that happen? Just because you got dropped. Just because somebody done something to you did, that, that maybe you didn't like, it offended you. Maybe it was a real life deal. You didn't ask for it, but you got dropped. So in 2 Samuel, where I'm going to take my, my text, I'm actually going to take it from 2 Samuel chapter 4, and then if you'll put your thumb there and flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. I'm going to read one verse, and then I'm going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 9 and start there. Talking to you this morning about dropped. 2 Samuel 4, 4 says this. Now Jonathan, Saul's son had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened, as he made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Now, that verse tells a whole lot about Mephibosheth. And that word will get you right there. Well, I'll tell you, you got to watch it. You don't want to say that fast ten times. That'll get you all messed up and you have to repent. Come on. It tells you a lot about it. It tells you how young he was. It was telling you who's in care of him. It tell you what was going on at the time that he became lame. There was a lot of information in that one verse right there. How many know how old he was? He was five. How did you know that? Because you read the Word. Amen. You can get stuff out of the Word if you read it. <laughs> he was five years old. A nurse was taking care of him. Saul and Jonathan, they were out on the battlefield and, and they got killed. And word came to his nanny, his nurse, his caretaker. And she was scared. And she picked up Mephibosheth and picked him up. And as she began to flee, she dropped him. And when she dropped him, it broke both of his ankle bones. Broke them. Clean in two. Broke them. And he had a problem that he didn't ask for. He became lame on somebody else's decision in life. This guy, he had to live with it. I want to point out something. Don't you ever think you got to live with what somebody else's decision, how, how it's affected your life. Because what happens, somebody will do something to us and we hang on to it. We give it a pet name because we've been dropped. And we think we got to carry that the rest of our life. And John 8, 36 says, whom the Son set free is free indeed. And I mean of everything. Man, I'm going to preach better than you're going to amen me this morning now. I'm just getting started. That's just the introduction. So now, if you will, jump with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's not very many verses, but I'm going to read the whole thing. This is a story. I mean, we always look at the story of the prodigal son, and we think, oh, man, what a beautiful picture of a, a soul coming back to Christ. That, and it is. It's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. And how the father runs after him, no matter where he's been, how he smells, and, you know, we, we got the story, right? And, and we think, man, that's beautiful. But I want to I wanna suggest today that this story I'm fixing to read is just as beautiful with a little twist on it. This story, as I read it, you're going to pick up on it, but I want to kind of open it, open it up a little bit. This story is like a metaphor of, of, of man and Christ, but it's where Christ goes searching for us. Well, that's a different twist, isn't it? Watch this. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now, in, in 2 Samuel 4, 4, we hear about Mephibosheth. You don't hear another word out of him for five chapters, nothing. Matter of fact, if you go read from chapter 4 to chapter 9, you hear about all of what David's been doing and how he's conquering lands and how he's obtaining uh, different spoils and he's, he's just building the kingdom is what he's doing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on that just didn't happen over days. So this wasn't just written like, okay, this chapter today and two days later we write this chapter. No, there's, there's probably a few years in, in this, if you're looking at chronologically, in between chapter 4 and chapter 9. Big deal. 
because I'm going to bring out some stuff. And you'll say, yeah, probably several years. Watch this. Uh, verse 1, 2 Samuel 9, verse 1. Now David said, that he's back at the palace. He's won a lot of victories. He's back at the palace. And he says, David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness of Jonathan's sake, for Jonathan's sake? Now that right there, if you, just, if you know anything about David and Saul's relationship, right there tells you God's at work. That David had been dropped somewhere by Saul. Saul tried to kill him. I'm thinking you could quali- David qualified for being dropped on. And so, but what does he say? He says, look, because of Saul's house, is there anybody I can show kindness to? If some of you in this building today are harboring uh, issues and hurt in your life from something long ago, you need to turn that loose. You need to drop that out of your life because that's hindering you from what God is wanting to do in your life. And you keep running against the wall saying, why won't God move? And God's saying, hey, you remember that thing you're still hanging on to? They done forgot about it and you hanging on to it. And you gave it a pet name and you carry it with you everywhere you go. And just and whenever you get an opportunity, you won't talk to somebody about it. Quit wallowing in the pig pen. Thought I'd throw that in there. It's not even in my notes. Verse 2, and there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. Now remember, Ziba was a servant of Saul who is now dead, okay? He says, and so he finds his servant. He says, so when they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? It's a question. And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who's, who is lame in his feet. I'm going to prove to you in a minute this is several, several years really from when he became lame. But I don't want to be known by my affliction. I don't want to be known by my imperfection. I don't want to be known by my being dropped. And all Zippa could remember, he said, uh, yeah, he's lame. He, he's got some lame feet. Some of you, if you want God to move in your life, quit being associated with what you used to be, how you used to do things, what used to go on in your life, or all the problems that was caused by you being dropped. Come on, somebody needs to say amen here. I'm speaking to you today. Spoke to me Greatly, when I was preparing the message, if you was wondering. Ziba said to the king, there's still a son of Jonathan who's, who is lame in his feet, verse 4. So the king said to him, well, where is he? Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Makar, the son of Emil, in Lodibar. And Lodibar is not a very good place. Kind of a funny word. Don't know that I'd want to be known from being from there. Uh, where are you from? Lodibar. I've heard it described in several different ways, a desert place. One definition I looked up said, not a pasture. <laughs> now, you can take out every how you want to, but I know what that means. When he said that ain't a pasture, that's the place you don't want to be. Amen. He says he's in Lodibar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, but well, excuse me, then the king, David, sent and brought him out of the house of Makar, the son of Emil, from Lodibar. The king went searching for Mephibosheth. Did you hear what I said? The king went searching. Now, Mephibosheth, he's just there. He's just hanging out. All he knows is what he could have been when his daddy or grandpa was the king and his daddy should have been the king in, in line next and all of that got taken away and he was lame. I mean, this guy's got the excuses. He's got legit excuses as to why he is where he's at. Family's dead. He's the only one left and he's lame. Nobody knows who he is and he used to be the king of Israel's grandson. Come on. You don't want to forget where you've been is my point right here. 
You don't want to forget whose you are. We get saved and we, we're all excited and we get pumped up and glory to God and everything's going good. And guess what? Then we forget whose child we are. We get to wallowing with other people that's been dropped and say, you know, that's right. Let me tell you my story. I can top yours. Come on. You ever been around people that's got a sad story and you sit there and listen for a few minutes and this one's got one worse than that and they got one that's like, glory to God. Jesus, I'm like, I, ew, I got to go pray and, and cleanse myself. Man. Hallelujah. Where was I? It's on the screen, people. <laughs> Verse 6, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. I think David said it in a manner that he knew who he was. He wasn't making fun of his name like he had been made fun of before because he was lame and because he, he used to have been or he should have been somebody. But he called out his name, Mephibosheth with authority and respect and honor. Because that's the only reason he's here. It's because he was honoring a covenant that David had made with Jonathan that said, hey, as long as I live, anybody of your offspring, I'm going to take care of. So it it was from a covenant standpoint that he heard his name. Some of you need to call on Jesus and let him call your name back from a covenant standpoint to know that he still got you where you are even in the midst of you being dropped. He's calling you because you are a son or a daughter. He's calling you with a covenant voice. Doesn't matter if you've been dropped. God says, I'll pick you up. Come on, somebody, you need to get this. I'm telling you, God's speaking to people in this message right now. Glory to God. And he answered, Here is your servant. That was the answer from Mephibosheth. Here's your servant. Here I am. Can I just say something else? When we get in the pit, when we get dropped, so many times we don't even look at ourselves as being in Christ, as a servant of Christ. One thing Mephibosheth knew, I'm your servant. I'm here. I am here. Some of you need to, in your hurt and in your dropped, being dropped, you need to acknowledge that God is there. You need to say, I'm here, Lord. I'm right here, Lord. I may be broken. I may be in pieces. I may be ripped and tattered. And mentally, I may be just shot. But here I am, Lord. Do with me what you will. Whoo. I feel the Holy Ghost in the house. Verse 7 says, so David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. There's that covenant again. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Glory to God, I'm glad, and I know Mephibosheth is now, that he accepted the invitation of the king to come to his house. Most of us think that when we go to the king's house after we've been dropped, guess what? That there's going to be another beating going on. That we're going to get out, he's going to get out the big stick and wear you out for being so dumb and making dumb decisions. Oh, that'll come. You already there. Come on, you beat yourself up. But what we got to realize is that when he wants to call us back to him, he's got a purpose. He wants to restore us. He wants to bring us to back where we are and give us more. Do more for you. That's the way God works. Isn't that crazy? You mean I can act crazy and be stupid and make all these dumb decisions and I can call on God and he'll say, yeah, come on back, son. Wow, what kind of God is that? He's a God I serve, thank the Lord. Woo. And you should lead at my table, verse 8. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Another point. When 
you get in God's presence and he's speaking to you, would you quit identifying yourself as a dead dog, as being dropped, as, as all of your problems? God's saying, wait a minute. That's not who I called up here. That's not who I want to sit at my table continue. That's not who I want to feed. That's not who I'm going to restore the stuff back to. We, we look at ourselves. The devil is awesome. Awesome about getting us to look at ourselves totally different than the way God looks at us. We make a mistake and we think, oh, that's it. I was way up the ladder, slid all the way down the ladder. Now I've got to start back over. Not just because you want to, I guess you can. That's not God's plan. God says, all you got to do is say, Lord, will you help me? Let me get through this. You start back off up there. Come on, that's just my analogy. It'll work, I promise it does. Come on, can somebody say amen? Preacher, you are preaching to my neighbor. Verse 9, and the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. I'm thinking that's a pretty good bank. I'm thinking he's going to do okay. I mean, Saul was the king, had a lot of stuff. He was God's, watch this, God's anointed king, the first one. God had him set up all right. He went a little left, and God says, you know what? Because of David's got a covenant with Saul's son, now i got a covenant with Mephibosheth. Guess what? Come on back. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to restore to you what you think the devil had stole from you. So he starts to restore, and he tells his servant, Ziba, he said, I'm restoring all this stuff back to him in verse, uh, in verse 9. Verse 10 says, You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Now I don't know about y'all, but I'm just thinking... If I'm in a place of Lodi bar of nothing, ain't no pasture, if you will, I'm just there and really don't know why they know me. Only way they know me is the old lame fella sits down the street. He's got broke legs. Oh, you can go by and tease him because he can't run and catch you. Come on. Even Mephibosheth said he was a dead dog. He didn't think very much of himself. I don't know how far it was from where David was to where Makar was, the city, and he came and got him. I don't know, maybe it's a day, maybe it's two, might have been a six-month trip. I don't know. But when he shows up at the king's house, man, everything changed. Think about it. Everything changed. He went from being dropped, thinking himself as a dead dog, to having land and servants and, hey, they're going to take care of the work. I'm going to get all the benefit, and I'm going to be at the king's house. They didn't have air conditioning then, but I bet they had them palm branches, and they would just wave me as he ate bread. <laughs> come on, y'all watch the Ten Commandments, ain't you? I mean, come on. You see what I'm saying? That's a pretty good extent. That's, man, that's like going from here to here right now. And my daddy said, that's like going from zero to 60 right now in a hurry. I like that. That's the kind of God I'm serving. Amen. Woo. Verse 11. Then the king said to Ziba, according, uh, then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, boy, that's getting me right there. Said to the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. What? Did you hear what? He, he's going to eat at my table like one of the king's son. No longer am I even going to look at you as a servant. You know what that really means? That when you get in the position to eat like the king's son, you get in line for the benefits of the king. Woo, that's a good preaching, preacher. Sometimes we got to unfold a story for us to realize where we're at and what we're missing so that we can say, I've been dropped. But I ain't been forgotten. I may have been dropped, but guess what? God knows where you are. God knows what you're going through. He knows every sickness, every sleepless night. He knows because he's God. And he says, oh, come on, come on. Whew. 
Glory. Hmm. Verse 12. Mephibosheth had a son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So now watch this. When we read about him in 2 Samuel chapter 4, he was five. Everybody say five. He was five years old. Now we read about him five chapters later, he got a son. There had been a few years transpire here, and we know the last time we heard about him, he was being scooped up by a nurse going to somewhere, and he was dropped. And he's been living a long time with the thought process, I've been dropped. He went immediately from a king's palace to, to nurses, to people taking care of him, to some place in Lodibar where there's nothing. And now, he's got a son. He's lived all of his life or a good portion of his life, those years that are very impressionable that make us feel and tell us who we're going to be. Come on. You know those younger years when you got kids and everything's going well and you think, man, I know what I'm going to do with my life. And then you get to be David McNamara's age and you think, Lord, what life? <laughs> I love you, buddy. You know what I'm talking about? You get in that place. And you think, man, you look back on your life and you say, I thought I would be here. I thought I would be at this point in my life. I thought I would have this much money or I thought I would have whatever. And you, the list goes on at this point in my life. Have you ever thought about that? I, I have. Lord, I, I didn't know I'd be here. And I mean, Lord, I didn't know I'd be here. Glory to God. That's good. And so he has been living life. As a dead dog and dropped and lame. I'm telling you, if the church will quit thinking that they're dead dogs, that they've been dropped and that we're lame, that we're no match for the devil, I'm going to tell you something real quick that may shock some of you. When God, let me put it this way. You may think and the world may think that it's this big struggle with God and Satan. And man, they're going out it. I heard one guy just the other day say it's like the Rocky movies. When Rocky would throw a punch and Apollo Creed would throw one. And boy, they're just going at it, just slugging it out. And that's the way it's happening. You're thinking, oh, oh, who's going to win? Boy, I hope God gets up and man, if we can get saved by the bell. Wait a minute. You're not talking about the God I serve. See, Satan is a created being. In other words, God spoke a word. Guess what happened? Boom, there he was. Guess what's going to happen in the end? Speak a word and he's going to hell. There's not going to be a fist fight. Isn't that good to me? I'm so excited. You mean we ain't got a fight? No, I got it. He's going to speak a word. Boom. So don't think that your struggles. You struggle a lot of times because you struggle. God's not struggling. God's got this great awesome plan. I promise you he is not struggling on your behalf. You're struggling on your behalf, but God is not struggling on your behalf. Never has, never will. If God can speak to nothing in the beginning and nothing respond, whoo! I'm talking about that's, a, that's my daddy. Yes! You know you like when you walk in the room, that's my big brother right there. See, if we get in a fight, I'm taking Brandon. Why? He big boy. <laughs> fight break out, you know where I'm going to be? Over in the corner and say, you go, boy, you go. You got him, ready? Come on, come on. Uh -huh. I ain't stupid. That's the way it is with God. You say, if the devil's messing with you, you got to say, hey, hey. taunt him a little bit. <laughs> I'm not saying mess with the devil like that, but you understand what I'm saying. Let him know whose you are. Oh, I'm a child of the king. I'm going to the king's house for lunch. Where you going? The king has said, look, I'm going to restore to you what you lost, what you got. The same thing you started the battle with me. Nothing. It's all he's got. Church, you're, you're sitting under the hand, under the anointing, under the presence of a God that, that spoke everything into you. A God that can make things happen on your behalf. And we act as if we're dead dogs because we got the dropped mentality. 
God says, get out of the drop mentality. There used to be a word, I don't know if it still exists anymore. You got the dropsies. Some of you older probably remember, you got the dropsies. My mom would get up and we get up in the morning. You got the dropsies? No, mom, it's just six in the morning. No, I don't have the dropsies. I ain't even awake. Dropsies meant you just didn't have any energy. You didn't want to get motivated to get going. You got the dropsies. Dad dropped that belt on you. You got the moving though, I'll tell you. I know they can't whoop people now for having dropsies. They need to be whooped for some dropsies. <laughs> Dropsy now leads to a lazy person later. That's prophetic. So we find in verse 12, as I said, that Mr. Fabusheth had a son. His name was Michael. It says, And all who dwelt in the house of Zibel were servants of Mephibosheth. Verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually. Oh, that's a key word. He ate continually at the king's table, and he was laying in both feet. You know what I got out of that? That as long as you want to eat at the king's table, you can, number one. And number two, no matter your imperfection, no matter what, the way you view yourself, may, you may think you're lame, but it doesn't matter when the king looks at you. He says, you're worthy of being called a king's son. You eat at my table. Come on, somebody give him praise in this house. I'm going to close in a minute. You say, Lord, that's the best message you've preached and it's you're closing too early. I ain't done yet. Can I have Tina, Lee, somebody? Somebody come up here to the piano? Ralph, somebody come to the piano. <laughs> Ralph said, uh-huh. Ralph said, mess is over. Watch this. These are some simple questions, but as I began to look at this message, I started asking myself some questions. And one question would lead to another question, lead to another question. And I'm going to challenge you this morning to ask yourself some questions about you. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about your spouse. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about, worry about you. This, is, this message is for you. It's for you. Say, it's for me, Pastor. So I asked myself this question. How did Mephibosheth become crippled in his feet? It's a pretty simple answer, isn't it? He was dropped. He, he, he didn't cause it. He, he was dropped. See, in, in the midst of what somebody thought they were doing right, and, and, and they grabbed up Mephibosheth, they dropped him. They dropped him. Andrew, and it messed him up. It, matter of fact, dropped him so hard not only did it break his feet, but it gave, it gave him a label for the rest of his life. We just read it. You may be in this room and you've been dropped so hard that you're identified with a drop. But God says, wait a minute, I, I'm here now. I got something different for you. So the first question was, how was he lame? He was dropped. He didn't ask for it to happen. He didn't wake up and pray and say, Man, I hope one day I'm lame in my feet and I get dropped and I get placed in an area called Lodibar. He didn't ask for that. Some of you in this room, you say, I didn't ask for it. But it happened to you anyway. I was serving God. I was minding my own business, teaching the class, doing what I needed to do, and I got dropped. God is here to pick you up from your brokenness. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. He's here to pick you up and say, you don't have to be identified as the one who was dropped any longer. He was supposed to be, watch me, you listen to this preacher this morning. 
He was supposed to be in the hands of safety in his nurse. She cared for him. No doubt, Fonda, she loved him. No doubt that, that Jonathan, his father, had hand-picked this woman. Because he's in line to be the next king. She's got her ducks in a row. She has been hand-chosen, Ian, hand-picked to take care of the next king. Come on. I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't know if it's on you or on me or in this room, but I feel the Holy Ghost, son. She was taking care of what was supposed to be king, the Israel's king. And she dropped him. She dropped the most precious gift she had. Mephibosheth. She dropped him and broke him. I just believe that I'm looking at people in this room all across this auditorium this morning that you've been and are God's most prized possession. And life has come at you and you've been dropped. And God says, wait a minute. Just because you've been dropped, just because you've got an issue, don't does not mean you're not one of mine. Does not mean that your anointing has left. Does not mean that I can't use you. God's got a plan for our lives. We just can't live as we've been dropped. He was supposed to be in the hands of someone who had a sure grip. That when he was snatched up on the run and said, we've got to go. They're coming to kill us. They have done killed your father. They killed your grandfather. And you're next because you're in line. I'm here to tell you something, honey. The devil may be after you because you're next in line. But God's anointing, God's hand, God's protection is on you. If you'll just say, God, I'm not dropped. I'm in your hands. See, when you get dropped a lot of times in life and you serve in the Lord, guess what? As soon as you start to fall, God says, if he's got the whole world, as the song used to say, got the whole world in his hands, I'm sure he's got room for you. Don't ever think because you've been dropped that God has dropped you. That is a lie. Listen to me. That is a lie from the pits of hell because God won't drop you. God won't let you go. He won't lose strength in his hands. Your circumstances, watch me now, listen. Your circumstances may have caused you to be dropped. But you don't have to stay there, honey. There may be things that's happened to you when you were a child. You may have been molested. You may have been tormented or beat or abused, whatever it might be. But I'm here to tell you. Because of the circumstances you had no control over, or somebody in this house I'm speaking to, because you had no, no control over that, the enemy has tried to use that against you. Every time you try to get close to God, every time you move in, the enemy brings that situation, that circumstance up, and all you say is, well, I'm just a dead dog because of a circumstance. And I'm here to tell you, you need to start declaring that you're a child of the king. You're an heir. You're in line for the kingship. Hallelujah. Feel the Holy Spirit in the house. I'm going to get personal and real with you for a minute, okay? Feel the Holy Ghost moving in the house. He wants to move in our lives today, church. He wants us to wake up. He wants us to act like we're sitting at the king's table instead of sitting at the enemy's gate of hell, the entrance. There's some circumstances that some of you in this room have endured once you grew up. That you had no control over. You didn't ask for. Maybe, maybe it was a spouse walking out on you. Maybe somebody left you and you thought that you, they were in love with you and you thought 
that when you entered marriage, it was for life and they left you. And you hurt. You just, you're just dragging your crippled feet along. You didn't have anything to do with it. You loved them with all of your heart. You begged them not to walk out and they walked out the door. Maybe it's been years ago. Maybe you've been remarried. Come on, preacher, you're preaching. Maybe you're already remarried. But you was dropped a long time ago. And you ain't got past it yet. You still feel like the day you did when you were dropped. You listen to me. You can't even love the one you're with right now because you're still so hung up on being dropped. My God, can I tell you to let go? God's got plans for you. Don't listen to the devil say, well, because you was divorced, now you're remarried, I can't use you. That's a lie from hell. God can use you. God's got a plan for you as he did the day that you were born. You feel like you've been dropped. Some of you feel like you've been dropped. You got a report from the doctor. You didn't have no idea it was coming. You didn't ask for it. You had a different thought, a different plan for your life. And you feel like you've been dropped. You ever feel like God dropped you? You feel like God let you slip through the cracks somehow, some way? You got to report. You say, God, how could this happen? You wanted to just go get in a corner somewhere and say, My God, I served you with all of my heart. God, I, I loved you and I taught classes and God, I prayed and I read and, and nothing happened. Why, God? Come on, I'm preaching to somebody today. Don't let your circumstance dictate who God is in your life. You may be in these situations and God's saying, I'm just waiting. I've been looking. I'm running after. If you'll just stop long enough to hear me. See, two weeks ago, the Lord began to speak to me in prayer. Not pray, and I told I told AJ in our Bible study, I just hammered it to him the other day. I said, AJ, do me a favor. He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to tell you how not to pray. He said, do what? I said, I'm going to tell you how not to pray. I said, don't go in to God and just give Him a bunch of requests and, and say, God, will you do this and do this and do this and, and, just, and just keep talking and talking and talking and, and then walk out of the room. Give him a chance to answer. See, we're in this society where we've got to have an answer right now because I'm up to the timeline and if it don't happen, I'm going to fall off the cliff in five minutes. And God says, you're not going to fall off the cliff. I've got you. Number one, always remember that. If it's good today, it'll be good tomorrow. And God, come on. I said, don't pray like I've been praying. God says, I want to have a communication with you. I said, God, I don't understand. I think I've been, I thought prayer was communication. He said, yeah. Well, if you go to your wife and you ask her a bunch of questions, how was your day? How did you do? What did you do? And you walk out of the room, you never gave her an opportunity to answer you. And guess what? She's still wanting to answer you, but you're gone now. Same thing happens with God. Give Him an opportunity to answer you. There may be something in your life, in that circumstance that you didn't ask for, that God said, I got something for you. If you'll just stand and listen, quit acting like you're in a pig pit. Quit wallowing. Quit acting like you're dropped. I got something. I'll use you. Your anointing is just as strong in the affliction as it is out of the affliction. You know why? Because God gives the anointing. It doesn't come from man. When God gives it, it's powerful. When God lays it on you, guess what? You're anointed. Come hell or high water, no matter what comes down the pipe, God anointed you. Don't get anointed. 
I may go through a practice of anointing someone as a, as a minister or something, but that's not the anointing you're operating in. I gotta hurry. And death took that loved one. You felt like you, the rug had been pulled out from under you and you did not know what to do. You were lost. You're still kind of, can I just be real with you? Still kind of holding a grudge against God. I love westerns. Most of you know I love westerns. I was watching a movie one time with Robert Duvall and called Open Range. One of the guys that was working the cook on the wagon, he got killed by a bunch of bad people. They buried him. Kevin Costner is one of the main players, and he's standing by the grave, and he looked at Robert Duvall, the trail boss, and said, do you want to say anything? And he says, no, right now I'm kind of holding a grudge against God. Now, I know that that's not Christian kind of talk, you know. But it really is sometimes because we talk about things happening in our lives. And we hold grudges because God didn't do something. Because God didn't, God didn't heal me. God didn't fix me. God didn't restore my marriage. God didn't do whatever it is. God didn't give me a million dollars in the bank. Or God didn't provide and I had to do this. Well, you're still here, aren't you? Come on. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible teaches... In Hebrews 13, 5, it's not on your notes, Hunter. That he would never leave you nor forsake you. Did you hear what I said? He would never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know about you, but there's times in my life, Bill, there's times that I feel like I am all alone surrounded by such a wonderful group of people surrounded by my wife and my kids there's times I feel like I am the only one standing in my situation and I am because I have to go through things that are designed for me and when I get to struggling I remember God says, son, I'm not going to leave you. I won't forsake you. I'm, I'm not going to drop you. I got enough power in one finger to hold on to you for eternity. I got you, son. Some of you need to be talking to God the way I talk to him. Just be honest. See, if you thought your pastor was super Christian, well... Got the wrong guy. But there's one thing I do know. If his word says he's not going to leave me. He's not going to leave me. I don't put my trust in people or things. But if God's not going to leave me, he's not going to leave me. If he's not going to forsake me, he's not going to forsake me. If he says it in his word, you can take it to the bank. The word teaches us in Proverbs 18.24, it's not on your notes, that he's a friend that's going to stick closer than a brother. i got some good friends in my life. i got a lot of good friends in this room right now and I that I love dearly, that I could call on right now. I could call on and, and, and things would happen. And I love you and I appreciate you for that. But Jesus is closer to me than anyone in this room. He's a friend that says, I'll never leave you. I'm going to be right here with you. No matter what you go through, I'm going to be here with you. Jesus will never drop you. 
Did you hear what I said? Jesus will never drop you. Let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you how I got this message. Last Monday, I believe it was Monday, we were working on the farm. Me and my son were moving this tank, 250 gallon metal tank. It was empty. Had skids on, we were going to move it off the trailer. We picked it up, going to slide it off. And I had some gloves on. He had one hand, had his hand under the arm of this little leg. We pulled on that thing and it caught on one of those boards on that trailer. Got a little angle iron on the back and it caught. Yanked that out of my hands. Fell on his finger. Where the metal and the wood meet on the side of the trailer. He yanked his hand down, peeled the hide off, peeled it deep, it went down to the meat. At that moment, I'm telling you, God, if you listen to him, if you pay attention, he'll speak to you and everything. When that happened, I said, my God's on your head. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'll never drop you. I'll never drop you. See, you got all that out of that? Yeah, because I'm listening to God. He says, I won't drop you. But that's where this message originated from. The pain that I saw my son go through, he said, I won't drop you. If you'll look to me, I won't drop you. I won't let you fall through the cracks. Church, he won't drop you. He won't drop you. He wants to hold you. And when you go through life, marriages aren't that good. Things are happening in life. Kids, finances, all those things. He said, I got you. I won't drop you. I won't drop you. I won't drop you. Last thought. As long as Mephibosheth was sitting at the king's table, listen to me, no one could see his imperfections. No one could tell Ralph that he was lame. As long as he was sitting at the king's table, Lauren, he was identified as somebody the king knew. He was identified as some type of royalty. At least somebody with an inside to the king. Nobody ever saw his broken feet. See, I'm telling you, when you get in God's presence, when you say, God, I surrender all, you're not identified by your dropping. You're identified that you're a child of the king. That you're sitting at the king's table and there must be something special about you or you wouldn't be at the king's table. See, it was an honor to be sitting at the king's table. You had to have an invitation. You had to, you had to go through a process to get at the king's table. You just didn't show up and say, I want to have lunch with you, king. A lot of times, it was months of preparation, of cleansing, to go sit with the king. Oh, but to have the king say, where is he? I'm going to go after him. Send somebody down to Makar to get Mephibosheth. Wherever you are, I just believe God's speaking to the angels in heaven saying, right there where they're at in Lake Village, let's go get them. They're, in, they're being dropped. They feel like they're slipping through. Go get them. Bring them to the king's table. Woo! Feel the Holy Ghost. Because God wants you to understand today. You can be at the king's table. I want you to stand with me across this building.